Hello, I'm Mercedes Stevenson, and this is the West Block, politics, perspectives, and players. The Trans Mountain Pipeline has the green light, but opponents are promising a summer of protests to try to block the expansion of the pipeline from going forward. Joining me now from Calgary is Trans Mountain President and CEO Ian Anderson. Welcome to the show, Mr. Anderson. Well, thanks for having me. Obviously, big news for you moving forward with this project. A lot of moving parts. Some of the first ones are the most basic ones, getting those permits to be able to build. Where are you at in terms of getting the permits that you need to start putting shovels in the ground? Yeah, the, the first step will be to re-engage with the National Energy Board. Uh, they came out with a, a process letter uh, this past week that will really lay out the next steps we need to undertake to to in effect uh, get us back to where we were last August and bring forward all of the decisions that the National Energy Board had made up to that point in time. That will give us uh, the clearance through them to get started uh, and that'll have us you know, ready to commence work in the same places that we were working last August. Uh, then we're gonna have some other steps to take with the provinces, uh, Alberta and British Columbia, finalizing other permits for other sections of the work uh, that were in process last year and, and have continued really throughout this period of, uh, of, uh, of delay. And we're, we're ready to recommence that process uh, uh, within weeks. How long do you expect it will take to get those initial permits approved so you can actually start the construction again? Yeah, the process right now isn't specific to time frame. If we look at what the NEB has laid out, my judgment is it should take uh, some weeks, uh, perhaps four to six weeks, to get to that point in time where we can start uh, back working in the field. So optimistically, I would say early September uh, could slide to middle of September. Uh, but again, we don't know exactly what the process is going to entail. We don't know what other points of view are that will be brought into consideration. But uh, I'm planning for a September restart of construction activity. In terms of overall cost, we were looking at about $7.4 billion, I believe, to build that pipeline. You'd mentioned that you expect there to be cost overruns. How much more do you think the pipeline is going to cost at this point? Yeah, we don't, uh, we haven't landed on that finally. We've run some various scenarios, obviously, uh, and I wouldn't refer to them as overruns at this point. Uh, the 7.4 was a number that was developed back at the late 2016, early 17. So it's, it's about two and a half years old. Uh, lots has happened in the marketplace since then. Obviously we've had, you know, inflationary effects, but also uh, delay costs money. We've been undertaking work and spending money for the last two years on various engineering and permitting and legal and regulatory aspects. So uh, it will cost more than 7.4. Uh, once we have a firm idea of the schedule that will flow from the conclusion of this National Energy Board process, we'll be in a better position to talk more openly and publicly about what we think the current estimate is going to be. Are any of the court challenges that are currently in process or ones you expect could be launched things that could impact the construction schedule for the pipeline and delay it further? Yeah, the, the only court action that's currently outstanding is one where BC is, is uh, challenging their reference case that they filed between, with the BC courts uh, about a year ago, and they're taking that to the Supreme Court, and, and we'll see where that goes. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it'll have uh, any direct effect on construction or us getting started or, or proceeding through the course of construction. Uh, parties have, uh, you know, time frames by which to file judicial reviews on, on the approvals that we now have in hand. Uh, that time will come sometime in July. We'll get a sense there of who's going to continue to try and legally challenge the project. And from there, you know, we'll be able to gauge uh, just how significant a, a threat or a risk that is. I don't see anything right now that is going to inhibit our commencement of construction or construction through, you know, the, the coming weeks and months. Speaking of threats and obstacles, there's been a lot of discussion of protests, of potential civil disobedience, even some groups calling for an attack on the pipeline's infrastructure. What are you doing to deal with those potential challenges and threats both to your infrastructure and to your workers? 
Yeah, well, that's my highest priority. My highest priority is the safety of the communities and the workers uh, and the infrastructure that's in place to make sure the environment isn't harmed. We have, uh, we have uh, very solid, comprehensive security plans and programs in place. Um, we've been, you know, aware of the activity that's been, uh, uh, that you refer to. Uh, we'll be prepared to protect our facilities. Uh, we'll be prepared to ensure that workers are kept safe. Um, we're really focused now uh, on, on getting back to work, creating some momentum behind that work, creating some positive, uh, you know, um, returns for, for, you know, the workers that are, that are going to be building this. And uh, we're not spending uh, a ton of time thinking about uh, uh, protest activities. People have the right to to express their views publicly, and we expect them to. Uh, our job is to make sure things are safe, and we've got plans in place to ensure that's the case. We had BC Green leader Andrew Weaver on the show last week. Uh, he said that he does not believe there is a demand for the kind of oil that we put through Trans Mountain. That only one tanker has left for China this year. How do you respond to those allegations that by the time the pipeline is built, there simply won't be a market for the product that's in it? Well, I think the best judge of that are our shippers and our producers who have committed to support this expansion for the next 20 years. So they've committed long-term contracts to move their product to market. We know that the market is going to fluctuate day to day, week to week, month to month. Uh, that's that's natural market dynamics that are going to pull those barrels in different directions at different points of time. Uh, we know that, uh, that Southeast Asia is well suited for Canadian heavy oil. Uh, we know that our shippers are developing those markets and have been over, over some time, but until they have the capacity to tide water, they can't truly develop those markets to their full ex fullest extent. Um, so our shippers believe in this asset, they believe in this project, they've committed for 20 years to this project, and I think that's the best gauge of its economic viability, that you've got sophisticated companies uh, believing that uh, this project is something that's necessary for, uh, for their future uh, production, and uh, I think that's the truest test. Mr. Anderson, one of the concerns that I've heard raised is that in Twinning Trans Mountain, you're building a new pipeline next to an old pipeline, and there could be a risk that during the construction there's damage to that old pipeline and some kind of environmental consequence. How are you dealing with that issue? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question, and, and our uh, asset protection or damage prevention program that the project is going to be required to uh, administer and adhere to is extensive. If, if I can use by example, the first phase of this project really was built in 2007 and 8 through Jasper National Park. Uh, a very successful project on time, on budget, and uh, we had literally uh, field markers every 10 meters over the existing pipeline as they were constructing the new pipeline in the in the same right of way and corridor. So we will have monitors on the ground, we will have inspectors on the ground, and the existing line will be marked. Uh, at every place where there's going to be any ground disturbance, there will be mats put over the existing pipeline so that there's no surface disruption there. So it's a very, very extensive program, and, and a program that is absolutely fundamentally necessary because we're going to be working beside a live asset and with oil moving through it. So it's, uh, it's an important part of our, our work, and we're going to have extensive monitors and inspectors in the field at all times to ensure the existing facility is safe. Would it have been less dangerous to simply build a new, more modern pipeline and not take the risk of twinning an older one? Well, the new pipeline will be new and modern to the highest technology that's available. Um, and uh, in fact, we are, we're going to be installing advanced leak detection along the new system, state-of-the-art leak detection that will benefit the existing pipeline as well. So that existing pipeline, while it's been there for 60 years, is in pristine condition. We, we test and we run tools through that line uh, on a very regular basis, multiple times a year. Uh, informing us on the, on, on the condition of the line 
so I've got no hesitation whatsoever to stand behind the, the integrity of the existing pipeline. And ultimately, we're going to be having two pipelines in place. The new pipeline is where the heavier commodities are going to be transported. And the, the existing line is where the lighter gasoline, diesels, and light oils are going to be transported. So it's going to be a, a very unique system, but one that's going to be entirely safe and sustainable. When do you expect that oil will actually flow through the pipeline, mm -hmm. and how much are you estimating will be coming through per day? Well, we're going to go from a capacity of 300,000 barrels a day up to 890,000 barrels a day when complete. Uh, and if our schedule holds, uh, we expect to be in service by mid-22. Uh, we have about a 30-month construction period uh, to build uh, the new pipeline. So mid-22 is when we would be expecting first oil to be on the new line. How much of a difference do you expect this pipeline will make for the industry in Alberta? Because they've said one of the big struggles is trying to get product to market. Is it enough yeah. to help to revive the industry, or would there have to be many more pipelines? Well, I mean, they're going to know best, and I'm not going to pretend to know their business or their economics in detail, and they're all different. But what we can say is that going from a very modest, you know, 50 or 75,000 barrels a day of capacity to tide water to around 600,000 barrels a day will be a significant um, uh, access point for global markets. Today, we know the Canadian barrel is discounted in, at, at varying amounts, $14, $15 currently, and we expect that this project will really help shrink that differential so the producers can get a world price for their oil, uh, have the ability then to reinvest that into you know, both production growth as well as technology investment to meet our, our national climate change objectives. So I think that the project itself will be a meaningful step forward for Canadian producers to get world prices and, and then to be able to use those world prices to invest further. Have you engaged at all with any potential Indigenous owners on the pipeline? I know there's a number of groups who are interested in investing. Is that something that would be along your role or would that be something that would be along the government's role? Well, uh, I've met with many. Uh, I know who all the interested parties are. In fact, I would say every community that we touch is interested in one way, shape, or form to economically participating in, in this pipeline. Uh, the minister as well has reached out to all affected Indigenous communities, and I think it'll be a, a bit of a collaborative effort between the Department of Finance uh, and ourselves uh, to run a process over the coming you know, months to determine just who and how uh, that uh, that transaction might occur. I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, I've always held the belief that Indigenous ownership in this asset is a worthwhile thing, that it can be an important uh, aspect of, of many nations' economic development and prosperity. So uh, I'll be working with the federal government. Uh, we know the counterparties. Ultimately, they're the shareholder. They'll make the decision. Uh, and uh, I'll provide my advice along the way. Are any of the changes to the pipeline's route that are a result of the con consultation with Indigenous communities expected to make it significantly more difficult or more expensive for the pipeline to be built? No, I don't think so. Uh, there's a couple of places where we're looking at route carefully where Indigenous communities are affected. Uh, I'm optimistic that we'll find the right route. We've got an approved route today. Uh, a couple of communities are questioning whether or not some deviation can occur to that route in order to protect and preserve some of their interests, and I'm, I'm well prepared to look into that with them, and in fact we are. So, But I don't see them having a material effect on cost or schedule. Uh, it may cost a little bit more, but not anything uh, dramatic or that would affect overall project economics. What is your message to Indigenous communities who feel the pipeline is being rammed through despite their opposition? Well, uh, we have to, I think, uh, look hard at where opposition is and where it isn't. I've got um, well north of 40 communities who can't wait for the pipeline project to bring opportunities to their communities, uh, jobs, uh, training, uh, contracts. Uh, uh, and, uh, and the like, and uh, certainly some are opposed. But you know, uh, there are there are non-indigenous people who are opposed too. 
Uh, nothing's unanimous in our society. We know that. We've dealt with that from day one. Our job, I think, is to listen, learn, understand as best we can what the issues are, uh, what the concerns are, do our absolute best to try and mitigate and, um, uh, and, and account for those issues and concerns and build something that's as close to everybody's satisfaction as we possibly can, knowing that nothing's unanimous.